Um, first I'll say Kiad Miel Fauci, which means uh, 100,000 welcomes in Irish Gaelic. Um, so welcome to this today. I'm very excited to be here to celebrate the day. Um, I feel like we have a few more stars here that haven't been introduced, and that's the instruments. And I'm sure you all want to dig it right in and get to know the instruments as well. So I thought maybe we could take a few moments to have the instrumentals introduce the instruments, and then we'll talk about the music and the history of Irish music as whatever you want to know. And um, please do feel free to ask questions as we go along. Um, in this style of an Irish thing, we ought to be doing some real conversation here, some, and I'll talk more about that in a few minutes. But um, we'll start with the instrumentals first. I have a variety of different sizes of whistles, not all of which I'll be playing today in the tunes, but um, the reason that there are so many different sizes, and there are actually more, is that each of these whistles can only play in a limited number of keys. Unlike the percussion, <laughs> <laughs> and, and the fiddle and the guitar, and my, a lot of other instruments. So the, the flute type instruments and the pipes are the ones that kind of dictate the keys in a lot of cases. So each of these whistles plays in only a certain key, and obviously the little one's going to be the highest. And then next comes the one that's the D whistle, which most people are familiar with. And then. As they get bigger, they get lower and harder to play. <laughs> and I don't think, I don't know if I've ever played that on this one. Let's see how it comes out. <laughs> I told you. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then this concertina is a, a later addition to the Irish um, music scene uh, in, the, in the 1800s, more, more or less. This is called an Anglo concertina. It works like a harmonica. You get you push a button, you pull out on the bellows. You just keep the same button down, you push in on the bellows, you get a different note. That's the difference between the Anglo concertina and what some other people play called the English concertina, where each button has the same note, whether you're going in and out. So the scale on this would be. In out, in out. So if you play harmonica, this would probably work for you. <laughs> Right. It has six finger holes and one blowing hole. And it's what they had before. They had flutes with keys and flutes made out of metal with cylindrical bores that were louder and were becoming more popular in the orchestra because they could be heard. Uh, fiddles were getting larger and louder and this guy kind of got put on the shelf because no one could hear him. And so the poor people in Ireland had this to play, where the wealthy people had the metal. Well, they weren't always metal. In the beginning, they were wood, but they were keyed and they were louder. So these were in lots of homes. And they crack, and they get pretty ugly when they're not taken care of. But. So what are your adaptations on there, Patty, I see? Oh, those, are, those are a secret. <laughs> oh, those are <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's <laughs> there are, those are orthopedic. Right. Well, I mean, it's nice to know because people don't more wonder what that is. People don't usually do that to their flutes. I don't usually talk about it. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't look at my notes. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. I've hurt okay. my hands a number of times. That's all. Well, it's good to know that you can still play your instruments. Yeah, I mean, that's it is. That's very good. Yes. I think and I'd I'll, be out of luck. <laughs> that's why I'm We'd really hands. be out of luck. Thank goodness. Yep. Right. So I'm sure all of you have seen one of these. Um, this is a fiddle. It's the same thing as a violin, in case you're wondering if there's a distinction. Um, it's the same actual instrument. It's just a difference in um, the style that you use when you play it. In Ireland, if the poor people did not play a whistle or a flute, they played a fiddle. All the people with, um, with the money, really, played pipes or harps. Um, and so the fiddle, you know, has, has a long tradition of being the, you know, poor citizen's instrument, I guess. The only real difference between um, the modern instrument that we play now and um, fiddles that were um, played in Ireland, you know, during the time that we're referring to is that now we have a rounded back. I don't know how well you can see this, but it's not completely flat. It has a little bit of an arc to it. Um, that helps it resonate more and project better. And fiddles before that had had a completely flat back, which makes them a little bit softer and a little bit um, more difficult to hear. Percussion around the world, of course, came from what the people had around them. You know, they would use their gourds that dried out. 
They would use roots and, and seeds in little pods. Um, they used the skins of the animals that kept them warm and also fed them, um, and the sapling trees to make their drums. So the history of the Bauron, it's a Gaelic word, B-O-D-H-R-A-N, pronounced Bauron or Boron, either way is fine, and many other ways of saying it, um, is, is questionable, as is a lot in this tradition, because it's handed down through word of mouth. So it, there's two basic ways that they talk about the Bauron. It either was a traditional instrument, and it came from an actual sieve-like instrument that they used to separate the chaff and the, and the grain. Uh, or there are also stories that it came in from when the Roman Empire came through or when the Arabic traders came through and they brought what's called a frame drum along. This, these are called frame drums. They have the wood around the outside and the skin is stretched across the head. They can have one or two or no crossbows behind them. Um, each drum and each drummer is different as to how they like to play it. The skins are often um, goat skin, uh, deer skin. Um, there are, there's very few with cattle. Those are mostly the African drums that have the cattle skin. Um, I can't remember the other one at the moment. Maybe some sheep skin because there were so many sheep. Um, so what they do is they create a shell or a frame and then they put the skin on top of it. Now because the skin is a, a live thing, it will react to the elements. So under these lights, this head is going to keep getting tighter. So you'll see me pick up a little spray bottle here and I'll be spraying the back of this drum to try to keep it a little bit more supple. Otherwise it gets really tight and like with Patty's wooden flute, if you don't take care of it, it will eventually crack and you won't have a drum anymore and you'll have to have it get a new head on it. The answer to that is to use a synthetic head, which is what this drum is, made by a percussion company called Remo. It's a synthetic head. I can stand in the pouring rain and play that drum. It doesn't shift at all. So that's really a, a, a godsend um, to us, to me as a percussionist that plays outside, but also in symphony orchestras, they replace the calf skin heads on the timpanis and the bass drum with these synthetic heads, and that made a big difference. So this is the Baron. They come in uh, anywhere from 13 to 18 inches, and uh, anywhere, the, the traditional ones have been about this deep, a little bit deeper. Now they are making them very deep. You'll see people playing a much smaller drum with a very deep, and that gives you a really deep sound, and as you press on the head, it will change the timbre of the head, so you can go from very low, very rich, resonant tones, and one of the word baron, one of the meanings of it is thundering, or dull sounding. You often play, it is a, it is a resonant drum, but you play it most often with a hand, which stops the resonant, or dull sounding. Those are two of the meanings of the word baron. So these are the, typically the drums that people play in Irish music. Then, because the people had a lot of sheep around, they, and some cattle, they began to play the bones, the rib bones, and that's what these are. They also make them out of rosewood. So you get a lot of different sounds. You can see that, that this pair is a lot larger than that pair. So you're gonna get a whole different sound. And there's different ways to hold the bones to play them. Because I have large hands, I have to adapt with smaller bones. And the other thing they did was they picked up the spoons on the table and they started to make rhythm with those. Now I can play spoons off the table, but not very well. So I do the cheating thing and I bought two different kinds of spoons. These are made in Canada, Canadian spoons. They're hollowed out inside there and they're a little notched there so they move down your fingers very easily. So it's, a, it's an instrument that most people can play very easily. There's a gentleman that plays in the Lewisburg area named Steve Catania and these are his cat paws. He makes these much more delicate sound. So depending on the piece that we're playing, I choose which instrument sounds best, as well as with the bones, because they have very different sounds. Then the um, tambourine, you add that in. This is a great little instrument. And then all my little shaker eggs, including this one, which is from Hawaii. It's a wooden shaker egg. Again, they all have a different sound, a different timbre. So depending on the piece that we choose to play, I choose the instrument to go with the sound of that. And then what you play the drums with is a thing called the tipper. And this is what a tipper looks like. They come in various sizes, various shapes, and it really depends on your hand and your sense of balance and how it fits for you. 
So I really love this. This is the first tipper I ever picked up and used, and I really love this particular style of tipper. It has a little notch. My hand fits in there very nicely. But you can also just buy dowel rods and put those little pencil holders on them, and that creates a tipper for you as well. Um, I took a lesson with a gentleman named Richard Sutton, who studies a lot in Ireland, and then he opened up the world of playing with paint brushes and these wonderful little uh, other kind of drummer brushes. These are uh, plastic, and this uh, this creates. We do a uh, a medley, and in that medley, I start with a paintbrush on the very soft one, which is um, uh, what's the first piece? I don't know. King I've of the never Fairies. Been you. Oh, Return from Fingal. We've been Return oh. from Fingal, and uh, and then we move on to the next piece, King which is Fairies. King of the Fairies. And so then I use this brush, whole different sound, and then I move to this drum and this tipper. This tipper is very light. It moves very quickly. I have to be careful to have a fairly good grip on it because it can go flying in the air. <laughs> and, uh, and I play this drum on that piece. So that's all the fun stuff that I get to, uh, to play with. And I hope that, yes, a question. Yeah, if, you, if we're not going to hear some of those things later, I would like to hear particularly the eggs and the bones. Oh, sure. Um, yeah, I would like to hear the eggs and the bones. Oh, sure. Um, uh, we will be I doing think we will be yeah. playing the bones. The oh, eggs are the simply. Um, little seeds like uh, ball, um, ball bearings or BBs. So there's that one. Listen to the sound and the depth. That has a lot in there. That has more. So it's a little bit deeper sound. Then you go. Nice and delicate. I use this one when we do Broom of the Cow Nows, in which both these ladies sing as well. They both sing. And then uh, we have a piece called King Shilling. And that's just the per Yeah, and then when it changes from talking about love lost and goes into war, then I switch to, you know, and make it, you know, as, as farty as this one's going to get. So those are, those are the, the eggs. They're, they're all plastic except for this one. And you can buy them. You could go to sides and get yourself some eggs, you know. All different variety of eggs are available. And fruit. We play the lemon and the orange, and we have bananas and tomatoes. No. no <laughs> plastic shake, fruit. More shakers. Plastic you fruit. wear those, don't you? No. But I do have a book that you can make instruments out of fruit and vegetables. So real fruit and vegetables. Yeah, I will be playing the bones. I think Patty and I will be doing a, a piece where you'll hear the different, some of the different bones. I think that's it. Um, yeah, this is a wonderful representation of everything that kind of summarizes in a way how varied the history of Irish music has been. There's a lot of preconceived notions about what Irish music is and it isn't. Uh, lots of debates that go on about what, what belongs in the category of Irish or Celtic music and what does not. But this is wonderful because you have everything from some of the earliest instruments of Ireland all the way to the most recent. Um, does anyone ever take a guess at which one they think was probably the first one? Bones. Bones and the Boron, yep, the Bones and the Boron are the two. Um, interesting thing, though, is the Boron was not played like this until 1960. It was the first time um, that the, the Boron was played in this manner. Before that, the way I learned the history of the, the term, as in the circles I understand, is that Boron comes from the word uh, thunder to deafen. And um, actually, was, um, an instru was not really an instrument 364 days of the year, or about 363 days of the year, except for on New Year's Eve, on um, and on, well, four times a year, they'd have four times a year they would actually get something like that out and play it as an instrument. Before that, it served as a chafing for um, separating wheat from chaff. They would use it to, um, to just throw the, cha uh, the wheat in the air. They could also use it sometimes for serving food, for storing things, it would, but it was a very common household item. And then they, um, but uh, four times a year usually, especially on New Year's Eve, how many of you have heard of the mumming tradition? Mm -hmm. Mumming actually is um, something that happens that in the Celtic pagan beliefs, they believe that four times a year, the um, worlds, the kind of the doors between this world and the spiritual world opened up. And on those days, they didn't want any spirits from that world coming to this world. So would, they would get out their borons and they would beat them as hard as they could um, to create a deafening sound. And that's the word boron stuck with them. Um, so it became a, a festival instrument, essentially. And that takes us back to probably the earliest folk music we know about um, in terms of uh, with the musical instruments. So uh, that's probably the first one we have. So, and then more instruments got added on top. But it, and 
this represents a wonderful collection of everything from that all the way to the present day, things like the tambourine you would not have seen probably until recent years. Um, but it's been one layer upon another layer throughout the many, many years of Irish history. Um, any questions as we go along, feel free please to mention. The interesting thing, there's one thing that ties uh, all of Irish music together though, um, and it's three words that we, we can um, translate from Gaelic. And the words in Gaelic are kjol akas krak. Um, if you've ever seen, gone to an Irish pub, they'll often see these words up there. Kjol is the word for music, akas is and, and krak is conversation or good time. Um, and that is something that characterizes all of Irish music today. It still is the, the most defining characteristic, and it's what makes this whole situation as relevant an Irish music traditional session as anything else, because we're having kjol, akas krak, um, uh, conversation, a good time, and some good music. Um, but that's, it hasn't always been this way. Actually, about 60 years ago, something like this, we would never have been able to have something like this. I'm sorry. Lisa, we have a question over here. Sure. And I'll, I'll repeat the question. Okay. Where does the Irish harp fit in chronologically? Very good question. The, the that's question, actually, I'm sorry. The ahead. question is where does the harp fit in? The today? Irish harp is the oldest instrument that we know of in terms of a classical tradition. Um, the first, we, the first information we have about the Irish harp dates back to the 12th century. Um, and it has since become the symbol of Ireland all throughout. If you look on the coinage, it's on the coins, it's on the flags, it's everything. It represents Ireland musically. Uh, but it is the oldest instrument. At that time, it was the instrument of the bards and the minstrels who uh, played for the Gaelic chieftains and the kings and the lords. Um, the hard thing about the harp tradition, though, is that it thrived during the time of the, the Gaelic chieftains, but over time, it declined. What happened was there was um, a gradual repression of, of Irish music and Irish culture um, with the British conquest. It's ironic that the, the first time we hear about the Irish harp was the 12th century. It's also the same year that began the British conquest, in which England came over and dominated. They started to try and repress Irish music um, through the bards, and actually by 15, I think it was 1571, there was a decree that all harps should be destroyed and all the harpers hung um, or hanged, and because they were they were considered so dangerous because they were the keepers of the tradition. They 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 played for the chieftains. They um, they were they kept everything that was Irish, and so when um, so when it was Elizabeth who felt Elizabeth the first who felt particularly. Uh, threatened by it, and she sent out a decree, and by 1603 there was a second de decree to destroy all harps and hang the harpers, and uh, by that point, of course, nobody really wanted to play the harp. So the tradition declined greatly um, until um, about 1792, it started to come back a little bit. Uh, there was a harp festival. There, by that point, the tr harps were almost gone completely. Um, in the in-between time, there was a wonderful composer named Turlo Carillon, who gave us the so much of the rip reper rich repertoire of um, Irish harp music that we still have, and I'm hoping we'll play a carol in a few moments. Um, but uh, 1792, they had a very small harp festival. I think there were only about seven, somewhere between seven and nine harpers there who could actually play, and it fueled some interest in it. And around that time, there was a, a start of a, a returning interest in Irish pride and Irish nationalism. And at that point, they embraced the harp again, and from that point, it started to grow. It had it kind of ebbs and flows. Um, but really then, it, it went through some dips, ups and downs for a while until 1960. Um, 1960 marks a very important year in Irish music because um, that was the, the beginning of two things, the Irish folk revival and also the formation of, um, of uh, Kiltori Kulan by Sean O'Riada, who was a, a Celtic uh, an Irish musician and composer and arranger, and he brought together a group that later became known as the Chieftains in a new form, if you know the Chieftains. And it was them that brought the whole Irish music thing back into life again. So um, I hope that answers the question. Uh, meanwhile, though, for the harp piece, though, since harp is so important, the harp tradition is very important, um, I asked them beforehand, I, th I knew that Carillon would be coming up at some point, I asked if they knew a Carillon piece, and they said they could play something, so you could oblige. Okay.
Uh, it's amazing that Carillon wrote during that time period I was talking about in which um, the, the, hel the harp tradition was being severely repressed, and yet somehow 200 of his compositions still remain, and they form a backbone of, of an amazing, amazing harp repertoire that we still enjoy like this. Um, it's been adapted by other instruments as well, though. Um, are there other questions at this point? Or? Yes. And just for the recording, which we're taping, um, the question is, what has the influence of Irish music been on other parts of the world in terms of global music? Uh, well, Irish music is everywhere now. Uh, if you, uh, there are Japanese uh, pipe bands. I mean, you find it everywhere throughout the world. People are interested. And uh, that was actually in large part with the, uh, I believe it or not, the Chieftains. I'll mm -hmm. keep bringing their name up probably because they were considered actually named by Ireland, Irish, the Irish government the ambassadors of Ireland. And they brought Celtic music around the world. They brought Irish music around the world during the 80s and 90s. So the point that they, it really piqued interest everywhere. Uh, before that, though, wherever the Irish diaspora was, wherever the, the culture came, uh, we preserved it, and in some places um, we held it at a time that even Ireland abandoned it. Uh, for example, the United States. If it hadn't been for recordings in the United States and some of the great Irish immigrants who came here uh, and brought their fiddles with them and their flutes with them and their instruments with them, they preserved it at a time when Ireland had let it go. They, they were dealing with so much over there that uh, the music just got thrown by the wayside. So, for example, during the 1920s, the best Irish music from the 1920s that was what we would consider kind of the authentic sound was actually being performed here, not in Ireland. Um, it was all happening here on the recordings of Michael Coleman and the, um, the transcriptions of James O'Neill. Uh, they were recording the things that still are considered the definitive recordings, the definitive um, arrangements, or not really arrangements, just the transcriptions of the pieces. So uh, wherever the Irish have been, they've taken their music and, and it's been paid back in full um, because it's just a wonderful back and forth. In fact, a, a scholar I studied with, I, I did a lot of research in Scotland, but there, she was looking for a lot of musical traditions she couldn't find in Scotland anymore, and she came over to the Appalachian Mountains to find the music that had been lost over in, in Scotland years ago. So we kept a lot of it though, when it was lost over there. That's good. That's a very good question. Thank you. Yeah, so the, uh, the music, the interesting thing, you know, what we have here, though, is the, the, the ensemble you see here, as I said, was, is a very new development. Sixty years ago, this would not have happened. You would not have had a concert setting like this, certainly. If you did, even in downtown Dublin, the hall would have been empty. Nobody would have come for something like this. And even this whole ensemble idea is only about, about 60 years old. Before that, they, people primarily performed as soloists. This was something that happened in homes, first of all. Um, they were known as Kaleys. It comes from the, the Gaelic word Achael, which means to visit. Um, they would visit one another in their homes, and they would perform, and they would take turns singing. And again, it's that kyolakas krak. It's that music and, and, and conversation. They'd tell stories. They'd sing songs. People would get up and dance. They would do things all in the home. Um, in non-Gaelic areas, it was known as house hoolies or house parties. Um, and it remained that way for a long time. Um, people would perform solos, though. It was, not, it was not ensemble music like this. The first ensembles we see were actually during the 1920s um, with the Cayley bands, which were essentially the equivalent to we had our, our big band orchestras in America, and they had Cayley bands there. They would get together for large Cayleys in the dance halls, um, and the performers, you'd have, you'd have these instruments. You'd have your fiddle, you'd have your, your Ilian pipes, you'd have your flutes. Um, various instruments, but you'd also have the addition of piano, snare drum, bass, things like that, and they'd perform and people would get up and dance. Um, so that was their style of entertainment. And that's really the first uh, Irish ensembles we had, really, that performed, but it had a very kind of a, a very international sound to it because of the new, the, the instruments that were brought in from, primarily from America um, as a style. So it wasn't until the 1960s that um, we got the first ensembles together who actually said, let's, let's put these instruments together. And it started with a, the composer and arranger, Sean Orieta, who had a vision of, the fact of, of creating ensembles that would interest the Irish people in their own music. They didn't really care to listen to music. Irish music has never been meant to listen to. It's been meant to dance to. Um, it's, it's, it's a dancing type of music. So the idea of people sitting and just listening is, is, is almost a foreign concept. Even still, when I teach music, uh, Celtic music in my classes, I always make my students get up and perform a dance. You just have to do it because you can't sit still. <laughs> um, it, it just seems wrong. Uh, so it's... Uh, so we have the ensembles developing during the 1960s with Sean Orieta and Kiltori Kulan 
um, and then began the folk revival, and that brought a, a lot more interest in Irish music, and thus you have a whole ballad tradition, the folk song tradition, that still, for the most part, if you notice, remains very separate from the instrumental tradition. They're two different things. You don't have people singing and dancing very often. Yes? We should. <laughs> I thought I was looking at something. <laughs> <laughs> this is dance for the people. You don't need special uh, performers. We Feel free to dance up. in the aisles. You can dance in the aisles, absolutely. <laughs> I started to say something when um, the woman asked about the international influence. And it's just kind of a, a quirky little, maybe not quirky, but um, we thought it was kind of quirky at the time. One of my trips to Ireland, we we were in a hostel and there was a Japanese woman in the same room with us mm -hmm. and uh, she had friends over there and they were all just enamored of Irish music. Mm -hmm. She also was a concertina player and she taught me a tune called the Chicago Reel. Mm -hmm. So it's like <laughs> around the world. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The world with yes, theme. very multinational. Good, good time for another little musical. Absolutely, yes. Do you want to hear Chicago Reel? Yes, you'd like to play the Chicago <laughs> Reel? That'd be great. And then maybe we could talk a little about the different types of pieces. Just Chicago. Oh, sure. And the reason I was smiling so much is because I missed the guitar. <laughs> Our guitar player couldn't be here today, so you know. It's very typical for all of the instruments to play melody, no harmony, so. except for a guitar to provide the rhythm and bass. So. Yeah, yeah, and that is the tip. Actually, the idea of accompanying with some kind of chordal instrument is very, very new to. to, yeah. to, most, to um, so yeah, tr traditionally all of this music is performed, everybody playing the same melody, um, and then it's it's a style uh, that we in the world of ethnomusicology called heterophony, where you have everybody playing the same melodic line, but everyone adding their own embellishments or grace notes as they go along. Um, and it just makes for a very colorful kind of sound. Often when they play, you hear like little blurps. It's only when you hear slower songs, they slow things down, you actually hear what these notes are like. But it might be a, a good moment to talk a little, to, if you could demonstrate Your maybe some of those. Some of the ornamentation, maybe be able to, I would ask them maybe okay. if they'd be willing to play. Yeah, the skeleton of a melody is called a skeleton, and then some embellishments. Yes, sure. you have a question? Speaking of ornamentation, where did you get your socks? <laughs> <laughs> your socks. Where did you get your From socks? her. Yeah. I found, <laughs> I, a, I found a whole bunch of them. She has a lot of yeah, yep. I have leprechauns too, if everybody wants. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yep. I found a whole bunch of them one year. Um, well, we can, uh, did you want to? Do you want us to do the bare bones thing? And yeah, if you'd like to do this, the skeleton of a melody means just the melody as you would find it written in a tune book. Um, just, just the notes without any kind of embellishments at all. If you could possibly play that, it's hard to take them out once they're in there. It is, yeah. yeah. We'll slow it, it down. I'm not going to play it all so they can. When we get back to your Again, put some yeah. embellishments in there, that'd be great.
there. Okay. Uh, Carol, too. Pick me up on the way by. <laughs> <laughs> It's an interesting thing with the, uh, I've heard often in teaching music, whether you teach music history or whether you teach world music, you can so often see in art the same thing you hear in music. And if you ever look at something like the old manuscript illumination and things like the Book of Kells, um, you'll see all the beautiful um, ornamentation around all the letters. And as you hear it in the music, you can almost see and hear the same thing. So yeah, an interesting thing is that what we're playing, they've played so far, are two reels. And the reels are actually the most popular style, um, type of music in the Irish repertoire but it's not what's commonly associated with Ireland. The reel is most popularly found in, in Ireland now, which you'll hear most often are reels, and they're great for dancing. Um, but what's most often associated with I the Irish is the jig, um, to the point where, although you can find, uh, what, what defines a jig is essentially that it's in compound meter, or six, eight, which means you've got that one, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, four, five, six. Um, they, when you count it out, they have, um, many different types of jigs. You've got your single jig, your double jig, your slip jig, your slide, all these different things. They can, they've got variations. It's, it reminds me of like, um, they say that the Eskimos have many different terms for snow because they see so much snow, they, they've got definitions for different types of it. And it's the same thing with the jig. The Irish know the jig so well that they have different names for the different types of jigs. Um, so maybe I thought we could just play a, a you can, Say what it's double jig? When you I'll try double jig. Okay. Yeah, double jig. The best way to know a double jig, if you just listen, you're counting it out. You say the word broccoli over and over again. Broccoli, 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 broccoli. You feel like you can count out out in, in th really fast threes, or if a clock is ticking in two. So it's one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. Broccoli, 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 broccoli. Whereas a regular <laughs> jig can be. In it too. Oh, uh, yeah, that's it. <laughs> uh, carrots and cabbages. This, this particular jig has some ham in it, too. Ham. Broccoli, broccoli and ham. It's not all broccoli. And, and carrots and cabbages is a regular jig. Oh, and no. black and decker is a real. So that comes by way of our, that's our guitar that. player. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Joe's here in spirit. Joe is here in spirit. Okay, not too fast. Century, there, um, th uh, I guess early 19th century, there were three different types of music you would hear in Ireland the, the reel, the jig, and the hornpipe. Until the early 19th century, they were actually, those terms were used interchangeably. The, the jig hadn't really taken form as the jig, um, it didn't really become what it was until the early 19th century. Um, but at that point, they started to really develop it. And it was also during the 19th century, they also brought in some um, imports, they brought in the waltz and they brought in the polka, and um, those are still very popular parts of Irish music. If you go to the average session, you'll hear some polkas and waltzes as well. So, did you want to play? Did you want Speaking to of Irish sessions, we actually have one in we this do. area. Mm -hmm. Second yeah. Thursday of every month mm -hmm. at the Red Horse Tavern in Pleasant Gap. Welcome yeah. to come and listen. Mm -hmm. We'll bring an instrument if you play a traditional instrument, too. Yes. Wait, aren't you playing your Saturday, though? Yes. Yeah, but this is session. Where everybody session. peep session is where people just come and play. Second, play and Thursday. play and talk. 
Yes, go Alex Crack. Let's repeat that. It's second Thursday seven. from seven to nine thirty at the um, Red, Red Horse. Horse Tavern. You can come in any time in those times. Seven to nine. Or you can come earlier and have dinner. Some of us do that. It's good. It's good. Okay. Yeah. Polka yeah. or with po the polka or the hornpipe? Which would you? Um, maybe whichever would you like to play. I'll play uh, hornpipe. Hornpipe. Okay. Hornpipe. Home roller. categorize um, the hornpipe um, versus the reel versus the jig. I said that the jig is in compound meter, that's that counting off in very fast threes. Um, the reel is in what we call duple meter, which means it's um, counting off in twos. The hornpipe is also off, is also in duple meter, but it's slower and it has those um, that da 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 that's, it's got those um, dotted notes that make it have a little bit of a kind of a lilt to it. Um, and the, the hornpipe was actually originally associated with English sailors. Um, and, but then it became popular in many styles of dance, especially in set dancing. Okay. Um, do we want to turn to that question that they had? Do you want any questions about the dance Should music we, before we, can, we? We can go back to that question. Sure. Would you mind repeating your question? Just for the record, the question it relates to whether um, uh, variations of music. Irish music I I emerged during the struggles uh, in the 19th to 20th centuries. Yes, especially vocal music, um, the vocal traditions. There are so many songs about stories of emigration, um, st forced emigration, stories of dealing with the, I the Irish government, and they continue. The songs continue to be written, continue to be sung, continue to be loved, um, because it represents so much of the Irish history. Um, when you realize that just, just the turmoil that they went through in the 19th century alone with the potato famine, that the population of Ireland decreased by, I think, about 25% in about 10 years. Um, one million people died during the potato famine. Another two million people emigrated within 10 years of the potato famine, many of them feeling forced off their lands, dealing with just the sadness of it and the disappointment and the starvation, the loss, the hunger, the pain. Um, it, it's the story of so many songs that continue to be sung. And some of them are angry and some of them are sad. Some of them are nostalgic. It, it covers the whole gamut of, of emotion. Did, did you want to add anything to that? Do you know some good Emma song? You want to sing? sing? Oh. <laughs> you want me to sing? <laughs> okay. Um, uh, one of the most famous, famous ones that people now associate um, is actually it's called Fields of Athenry. By lonely prison walls, I heard a young girl calling. Michael, they have taken you away. Let's see. For you stole Trevelyan's corn, for your young to feed by morn. And a prison ship wait stay, sorry, stay, a prison ship stays sailing by the bay. Lo, oh, lo thank you. <laughs> sorry, I'm putting on the Lo lie the fields of Athen Rye, where once the young and free we wa where once we watched the young free birds fly. Oh gosh, I'm sorry, I'm not on the spot here. I get thrown off here. Yeah, I like oh. it. I mean, I actually, <laughs> I've actually have never, um, okay, we'll try this again here. Um, our love was on the wing, we had dreams and songs to sing, now it's lonely by the fields of Athen Rye. And the whole story is relating a time where um, people starving just to feed their children at the time. Um, 
and there's no food they had to steal. And so the person gets imprisoned and then sent away to go to Botany Bay, which is a prison colony for the Irish people. Um, and so it's the people having to deal with the loss of a loved one. Um, there's so many stories, and I didn't, I'm sorry, I did not represent that well. <laughs> um, but there's so many wonderful songs that were written, and that's actually a fairly new song. It was written in the 1970s, but people love it as though it was written in, during the 19th century. But songs like that date back through the last two centuries. Um, very political. Yes? So just a quick recap of the question. The first part being, um, are there differences in the styles in different counties or regions in Ireland? Mm -hmm. um, and the second being, how has the music changed in different uh, parts of the world, such as Australia? Okay, that's other a good question. Um, the, 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 regarding how it is throughout Ireland, it's not so much that the songs are different, but the styles of playing and styles of singing are different. Um, you'll find, for example, in the northern parts of Ireland, near County Donegal, um, they have, it's a very strong influence from the Scottish, uh, Scottish culture there. So you're going to find uh, more kind of staccato, more um, kind of, short and little kind of quick sounds to it. It's, it's very like sharp sounding. Whereas in County Clare and in the south, um, County Kerry, County Cork, you'll find that it's a smoother style of playing, um, more legato, more free flowing. Um, then probably in terms of the, the kind of the whole world aspect of the global aspect of it, um, if people came from certain areas, they would keep what they learned, where they went. But the one big difference is that um, some of the key performers I mentioned before, people like Michael Coleman, um, when they went abroad, they took their music with them and they recorded it. And when they did, uh, my, I believe my, Michael Coleman was from County Sl the, the Sligo style, the County Sligo style. So when, once it went on recording, people started playing like what they heard in recordings. If anybody tried to learn music, they'd, hear, they'd learn it from recordings. Um, they learn the Sligo style, which is a very bright, fast kind of style. And so what most often is heard throughout the world, if it's people have learned from recordings rather than from somebody directly in, in lineage to somebody in Ireland, um, they'll sing, usually perform in the Sligo style. So which is, I say, it's a, and they're all very, they all are very different. And um, I don't know whether you can demonstrate or whether you have any things to add to that as performers. You want to do a polka? You want to say? We could do a polka. Yeah. Okay. for a couple more questions and then maybe uh, the band can play us out. Okay. okay, we have a question up front. Well, perhaps you covered it, but uh, how about James Galloway and Penny Whistle? Uh, is that considered so? Yes, yes, certainly. Um, James Galloway, I mean, he's a classically trained uh, flautist, but um, he, he made once, he, what's that? Flautist, flutist, yes. Um, he, ma he made that crossover. I believe the first time he really explored a lot of the Irish connection was once again working with the Chieftains um, when they worked with him on an album. And uh, he played some of it before that, but that's really when it, I think it came out. Do you know more about the history of, of James Galway? Just that he's a classical player and he's yeah, what, that's from Ireland. Is the penny, is the penny the whistle? He does, yes. And I have a disc of his and there's um, Sakura, you know, the mm -hmm. Japanese, Japanese Sakura. Sakura. Yeah. Yeah. It's really good. Yeah. Yes, very good. Yes, um, I've heard, and I'd like to ask if it's true, that Danny Boy was actually written in New York City <laughs> and Pan Alley. And I'm wondering if you could comment on sort of the commercialization yes, of Irish music and how that affects our perception of what is commercial. Okay. That's a good question. I know you've got strong feelings about this. <laughs> um, Danny Boy was actually written by an English lawyer. 
Um, the melody, though, it was an, it was a, it's known as the Londonderry Air. So it was a traditional Irish melody, um, but then put with added English lyrics added to it. Um, there were other, there are many other lyrics that were Irish that um, were written by Irish people, but Danny Boy's the one that stuck. Uh, <laughs> It got the most uh, publicity. Do, do you want? Do you want to add in about this at all, or I don't want to. Um, no, that's good. Cool. Okay, so yeah, but it, it does bring up a lot of questions about this. There's so many things. I mean, even t um, you've got you've got him. You've got a lot of the Thomas More melodies. Thomas More was a, a an Irish poet who wrote um, some. He wrote a lot of uh, English lyrics to go with, for example, Carillon's music and um, a lot of the collections from the around 1792. Um, but he turned it into parlor music. Mm -hmm. Parlor music, they, what happened with that is they basically, so this started back in the early 19th century, they started kind of cleaning up the music, making it sound a little better. If it was too modal and kind of weird sounding, they'd change it so it was more, uh, more suitable to the, especially to the things like pianos. Um, they started writing piano accompaniments and so it sounded really pretty. And that was a tradition that was going on throughout the 19th century and it entered the, the parlors, it entered the homes of middle and upper class people who would sing the music. Um, so you've got that whole strain going. Um, Danny Boy enters into that, that category of those things. Um, you also have, um, the tr coming across the sea to America, then Stephen Foster got on the bandwagon. How many of us think of I Dream of Jeannie with the Light Brown Hair? Um, as, is it Irish or is it not? You know, we can't tell. Um, but he was, he was drawing, essentially, modeling his music after Thomas More. Um, so there's a lot of this music that it's very difficult to categorize. And I, I've spent, well, a dissertation of 500 pages talking about how do we talk about authentic and not authentic in Celtic music. Um, and it's, it's a very difficult thing to figure out. And you'll have, you can have heated debates, I mean really heated debates, uh, of between very people who are very purist in their approach and people who say, well, what is it? I mean, the fact is now um, somebody who is of the more purist stripe would say this doesn't belong in Irish music. Danny Boy is not an Irish tune. It is not an Irish song. Um, on the other hand, there'll be people saying, well, if they're singing it in Ireland, is it so bad? You know? <laughs> so, so does that make it Irish? So and it, and the, the debates go on and on. And it, so, but it, it just makes it so it's constantly um, a, a kind of a point of contention, certainly. And if you have things to chime in on this, especially as people who perform. Well, I was in a session in Ireland last summer, and they played the Yellow Rose of Texas. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. It's oh, always a thing. What, what constitutes something as Irish or as Celtic is whether it's performed in Ireland, and if they make it their own, then it can be. So there are many, th many examples like that where they, they do make the music their own. I mean, pretty much the music, I guess, if it was never written down, that's traditional music, right? Right. Because it's passed down through word of mouth. That's yeah. why the same tunes have different names. Right, yeah. So, and I mean, that's sort of a little guideline anyway. Right. And even, but even ones that were, so they, they so quickly can enter the popular repertory, repertory yeah. like, like Fields of Bath and Rye. Um, something like that was written in the 1970s by, a, you know, this is a folk music revival kind of thing. And it became so quickly adapted by the Irish people that now they'll sing it at, at sporting matches and they'll start chanting out um, Irish Republican chants in the middle of it because it's so much of something they've adopted. So it's not a traditional folk song per se by definition and yet it's become part of the, the population and part of the populace. Well, thank you. We have to end on that note, but please join me in thanking Lisa Jenkins and pa Patty Lambert, Gretchen Lee, and um, Carol Lindsay for a very enjoyable hour of Celtic music. Thank you very much.